I was born in 1959, fifth child in a family of eight. My father, Aziz Radwan, was from Egypt. He brought us up as Muslims, but wasn't very strict. He used to say, Adinu Mu'amala, religion is about how you treat people. He paid a Tunisian sheikh to teach us Quran and Arabic at home. My mother, Mary Magson, was from a Christian family, but converted to Islam largely to please my father. She used to say, it's all the same God. I wasn't religious growing up and sometimes resented the fact that I'd been given a funny name and exotic religion in a country where few shared them at the time. But as I reached my late teens, confusion about my identity and a series of events caused me to rethink my views about Islam. The first was the Islamic Revolution in Iran. I found the TV images inspiring, defiant civilians rising up against a brutal tyrant. I was also aware the role religion was playing, my religion, Islam. I was confronted with another example of the power of religion when my close friend returned from a camping trip to announce that he was now a born-again Christian. He became irritatingly exultant about his faith and constantly attempted to convert me. But the more he explained things such as the Trinity, original sin and atonement, the more I knew that these were concepts I could never believe in. A few months later, I saw Cat Stevens on television giving a farewell concert. He had become a Muslim, changed his name to Yusuf Islam, and resigned from the music business. I felt that if such a creative person like Cat Stevens saw something worthwhile in Islam, perhaps I, as someone born with an Islamic heritage, should take it more seriously. The final episode was when my father invited me to go to Egypt with him for a holiday. I was now 19 years of age and at a crossroads in my life, unsure of my identity and where I was going. We stayed at my uncle Fuad's house in Cairo. He was very religious and we soon got into discussions about religion. He gave me a copy of the Quran to read. As a child, I had read and learned a few surahs, but this was the first time I read it right through. And to my surprise, I found I couldn't put it down. The Quran is not like any ordinary book. It doesn't follow any of the conventions of standard prose. It has no definite beginning nor end. There is no plot to follow and no neat resolution. It jumps abruptly from one account to another. Even its style changes with little warning from a steady narrative to a fast-paced rhyming prose. Yet I found it strangely irresistible. It seemed to speak to me on a deep level and I found it comforting. God is light upon light closer to you than your jugular vein, ready to answer the one who calls upon him. Wherever you turn, there is the face of God. Be humble and avoid arrogance. Forgive others and control your anger. Treat family, orphans and those in need with kindness. Stand up for justice and keep your trust. No one shall carry the burden of another and no one shall be wronged in the slightest. God sees and appreciates all you do, even if others do not. Not a leaf falls from a tree, but God is aware of it. I felt inspired, and the words moved me to tears. I was certain it was the gentle and loving presence of God speaking to me. I spent most of the holiday reading Quran and meeting members of my extended family, where the conversations invariably turned to religion. I returned to England, full of zeal and determination to immerse myself in Islam. I immediately enrolled for a BA in Arabic and Islamic studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, taking tafsir and pre-Islamic poetry as my specialist subjects. I was fortunate to have three wonderful and charismatic Arabic scholars at Soas at the time, who in successive years each became my personal tutor during the five years there. Dr. David Cowan, the convert and author of Modern Literary Arabic, Dr. Wandsborough, the author of Quranic Studies, and Dr. Abdul Halim, the author of the popular translation of the Quran. As a young Muslim keen to soak up everything I could about Islam, I found the atmosphere at Soas invigorating. I attended every extracurricular lecture and debate. I devoured anything and everything that had Islam as its subject matter. And the Soas Library became my home, with its shelves packed full of rare and interesting manuscripts. I stayed late into the night, 
and regularly had to be asked to leave by staff locking up. In between my efforts to learn about Islam, I was also busy spreading the word to others. I was motivated by an ardent desire to share what I had discovered and to save them from hell. A friend invited me to join him on a tablighi jamaat, a movement aimed at bringing Muslims back to the path of pure Islam. I found myself on a long road trip heading to the Dewsbury Mosque, nestled in the Yorkshire Moors. There we listened to talks and invited locals to attend prayers and lectures. The experience of being isolated in the mosque, cut off from the world, had a profound effect on me. By the time I returned home, I found my priorities had shifted. I was less concerned about this life and far more focused on the next life. I let my beard grow longer. I wore a jilbab and cap. I not only prayed all the compulsory prayers, but I prayed all the extra prayers too. I did my best to follow each and every sunnah I could. I fasted every Monday and Thursday. I sipped water in three breath pauses. I entered the door with my right foot, slept on my right side, used a miswak daily, and so on. I was determined to keep in my mind that heightened sense of taqwa that I had felt at the Dewsbury Mosque. I became president of the SOAS Students Islamic Society from 1981 to 1984. During my presidency, I set up an Islamic book stall, organized talks, debates, films, a prayer room, and permission to use one of the lecture rooms for Friday prayers. We shared the responsibility of giving the khutbah amongst ourselves, as well as inviting speakers from outside, such as Adil Salahi, the translator of Sayyid Qutb's tafsir in the shade of the Qur'an, and Dr. Kalim Siddiqui, the director of the Muslim Institute in Ensley Street, and his understudy, Dr. Riyas Adin. It had been my spiritual search for meaning and identity that had brought me to Islam, but it was soon taken for granted that I would support the political stance of other Muslims on issues such as Palestine, Kashmir, Afghanistan, and later on, Bosnia, Chechnya, and Iraq. Traditional views of Islam see no division between politics and religion. There's no render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Prophet Muhammad was a military leader as well as a spiritual leader, and applied Islam to every part of life, both public and private. Muslims were to be regarded as one body. If one part of the body feels pain, then the whole body suffers. Therefore, I felt my commitment to Islam meant a commitment to my Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. I began to take a keen interest in global politics. The major issues at the time were the Iranian Islamic Revolution, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, and of course the ongoing issue of the Palestinians. The plight of the Palestinians was highlighted in 1982 when unarmed Palestinian men, women and children were massacred in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps by Christian militia while the camps were surrounded by the Israeli military. I remember seeing pictures of whole families lying dead in the narrow streets, their bodies bloated by the hot sun, hands still clutching the ID papers they had been desperately trying to show. The images created enormous anger within me. The Russian invasion of Afghanistan triggered quite different emotions. The struggle of the Mujahideen against the might of a superpower was inspiring, and it seemed to confirm the oft-repeated claim that only by returning to pure Islam could Muslims ever put right the injustices that we had suffered. My brother and I led an Islamic circle at the East Finchley Dawa Society. It was for young Muslims learning more about their faith. The meetings were mixed and informal, we invited speakers such as Sheikh Darsh from Regent's Park Mosque, a delegation from the Federation of Student Islamic Societies, and the modernist Dr. Esawi, and Brother Yusuf Islam. The Dawah Society produced its own magazine called The Clarion, which I edited, and included articles about Islam and topical issues. We also organized sports activities and camping trips. It was noticeable that by the mid-1980s, some hard-line and narrow-minded political Islamic groups began monopolizing such meetings. The most prominent of these were the Salafis, who espoused a very literalist form of Islam that sought to cleanse the religion of what they regarded as innovations, superstitions, and heresies. 
Throughout the 1980s, Saudi Arabia financed the spread of Salafi doctrine through mosques and bookshops up and down the country. It's no exaggeration to say that they changed the face of Islam in the UK and indeed the world at that time. The Salafis were not the only group gaining ground at the time. Hezb Tahrir, a group aimed at creating an Islamic state in Muslim countries, were their main competitor. One of their prominent members at the time, Farid Qasim, became a regular visitor to our Dawah society. His one overriding obsession was the Islamic state, and he often hijacked discussions to propagate his views. Farid and his mentor, Omar Bakri, were too radical even for Hezb Tahrir, and they left to form an even more militant group called Al-Muhajirun. Islam places great emphasis on marriage, and as a young single Muslim, I was soon being encouraged to get married to complete my deen. In 1983, I was introduced to a devout Muslim, and we married a short while later. Marriage has the effect of cementing your beliefs and lifestyles, as they are now shared with your partner and children, and your investment in it becomes set in stone. I had five children in total across two marriages, though my baby daughter Huda was premature and died in hospital a week after she was born. I remember staying up every night praying and making dua to Allah to save her. When she died, I consoled myself that God knows best. It was a test, and she was in a better place. I also blamed myself. I must have failed somewhere at being a good Muslim. So I tried even harder to be a better Muslim. After graduating, I began my PhD into the tafsir of a I had translated a third of the tafsir and written two full folders of commentary when the need to earn money for my family meant that I shelved my studies to complete my postgraduate certificate of education so I could begin my 30 years as a school teacher, 15 of which I spent as a senior teacher at Islamia School, the one founded by Yusuf Islam. Islamia School was both a mad and wonderful place. The sincerity, commitment, and genuine warmth of the individuals involved made me feel part of a huge family. The pupils I taught over the years will always remain in my heart and were as dear to me as my own children. Throughout my years there, it was always much more than a job. I was, of course, faced with incidents and awkward issues that I put in a box labeled, God will explain later. But I was so sure that Islam was true, that if there was anything that didn't make sense, I put it down to my own limitations. It's very difficult to doubt and question things you've taken for granted since childhood and become emotionally attached to particularly when they form the basis of your whole identity. We only tend to question things when we look at them from a fresh perspective. But in order to get that, we need to be shaken out of our comfort zone. A series of events in my life gradually began to do just that and forced me to look at things from a different angle. The first major one was 9-11. I was teaching at Islamia School on September 11th, 2001, as the news of the World Trade Center attacks began filtering through. The school closed early due to death threats made to the school. I remember there was an eerie silence as I drove home. I asked myself, how could anyone do such a thing in the name of God, in the name of my religion? How could they get Islam so totally wrong? My instinct was, of course, to distance Islam from their actions. These people were motivated by a twisted sense of grievance, be it political, social, or psychological, and they were just using Islam. However, some of the ridiculous conspiracy theories that suddenly emerged from the lips of otherwise intelligent people shocked me. Worse still were a minority who actually tried to defend the attacks, arguing that they were not innocent because they had voted for the kufr system that was bombing Muslims. A close friend of mine had become a hardline Salafi and had begun to follow a sheikh who was telling his followers to emigrate to Dar al-Islam to fight the kuffar. He read me a bayan from his imam that was full of quotes from the Quran and Hadith used to justify the most abhorrent ideology. Here in front of me was a perfectly sane and intelligent individual who was completely certain that he was right in defending the indefensible. 
Of course, I dismissed his views as a twisted perversion of Islam, yet I couldn't help feeling shocked at how he could believe these things with such utter conviction. It left me wondering if I too was certain of things and yet could be completely wrong. There were also events in my personal life that shook me out of my comfort zone, including the breakdown of my second marriage. But the greatest blow was the illness of my eldest son. He had fallen in with a group of friends who were smoking cannabis. Ironically, they were from Islamia school, the very place I had sent him to be safe and secure. Unfortunately, cannabis triggered schizophrenia in him, something that he has now suffered from for the past 13 years, requiring regular medication and constant support. Again, many prayers were offered, and in particular, to Wassel, begging God, because God loves those who beg him. I thought back to the nights I had begged God to save my baby daughter, Huda. I had believed with all my heart the words of the Quran that said, Call upon me and I will answer you. He it is who answers the distressed one when he calls upon him and removes the evil. Now here I was again begging God not to take my son, the light of my eyes, away from me. But as always, the heavens stared back with silent indifference. Like most Muslims, I made a thousand and one excuses for God's apparent lack of response. It was a test, and God will reward you for your sabr. God has a greater wisdom. It was for the best. It was my fault. I must have done something wrong, or my intentions were wrong. And then, of course, there was the old, God responds to what we need, not what we want. Clearly, I needed my heart broken into pieces. The Qur'an mocks idols of the pagans and challenges them with a very simple concrete test to prove their gods are false. Call on those whom you assert beside him. They have neither the power to remove your troubles from you nor change them. They will not answer. But does God answer prayers? Couldn't the excuses I gave God be applied to the pagan idols? At what point... Is it reasonable to give up knocking on a door when there is no answer? Muslims will say, never. But would they say that to the pagans or to those of another religion? I was still teaching at Islamia school when the 7-7 London attacks took place. And again, I was confronted with embarrassingly absurd conspiracy theories, as well as shocking attempts at justification. Discussions in the staff room in better times had generally been about trivial matters, such as what things break will do, or are food additives from insects haram? But now I started asking, how could Muslims use the Quran and Hadith to justify acts of terrorism? Why would God never forgive shirk? Isn't hell an excessive punishment? Of course, the answers came in the form of verses, Hadith, and sayings of scholars. In the past, I would have just said, Masha Allah, and nodded, in pious agreement. But now I couldn't help questioning the logic of these texts. I started looking at the Quran in a much more critical way, something we Muslims never truly do. Our starting point is that it is the perfect word of God, and reading it is an act of devotion, not critical assessment. Any problems that are highlighted are due to our flawed and limited understanding. Any energy spent dwelling on them is only directed at absolving the Quran rather than entertaining the slightest possibility that it could be wrong. However, I was determined to be brutally honest with myself. Amongst the verses that troubled me, the following stood out. As for those women from whom you fear rebellion, first admonish them, next refuse to share their beds, and last, hit them. I tried many times to explain it in a way that made sense, but it gnawed at my conscience. I revisited the arguments I had heard many times that the conditions and restrictions which the Qur'an placed upon white beating amounted to a virtual ban, particularly since Muslims are obliged to follow the Prophet's example, and he never laid a finger on his wives, saying, the best of you is the best to his wife. The Prophet also said that such a hitting must not be severe, غير مبارح, and so the scholars say it must be light and was just a symbolic show of displeasure to be administered using a tooth stick. But these arguments no longer convinced me. If it was true that these restrictions amounted to a ban, then why not just ban it? 
The Quran had no problem banning polytheism, which was far more entrenched religiously and financially, and didn't hurt anyone. I came across interpretations that claimed the words hit them actually mean leave them alone. But this explanation not only reveals complete ignorance of Arabic, it highlighted that I wasn't the only Muslim who couldn't believe God would allow a man to hit his wife. But instead of questioning the Quran, they resorted to absurd apologetics. Seeing how desperate they were to protect their faith against all reason only served to weaken mine. Once I doubted one verse, I soon found myself doubting others, particularly those about hell. No other holy book describes the tortures of hell in such graphic detail as the Quran does. Unbelievers are to be kept alive so they can have their skins repeatedly roasted or peeled off by hooked rods of iron, molten brass poured into their mouths and over their heads so that their faces melt. There will be no respite, no let up, just constant torture for eternity. Each time they die, they will be brought back again so that they keep screaming in utter agony. I remember one khutbah where the sheikh pointed out the scientific miracle in the verse that says their skins will be replaced. He said, science has only recently discovered that the pain receptors are in the skin. He beamed triumphantly. Yet here is Allah telling us 1,400 years ago that the unbelievers will have their pain receptors replaced so that their pain will never stop. How can it make sense for a god to torture his flawed and limited creation without end? What purpose does it serve? I remembered reading about a cruel Central Asian dictator who had Muslim rebels executed by boiling them alive in vats of scorching oil. I thought, what kind of insane monster would do such a thing? Yet the Quran says that God will not only do that, but will do it forever, preventing these wretched souls from dying so that they endure this unimaginable agony forever. It contradicts all reason and justice and makes a mockery of the Qur'an's claim in typically hyperbolic style that God is the most merciful of those who show mercy. Like many Muslims, I used to respond to the question about hell by saying, oh, it's just metaphorical. But I had to admit that this didn't make sense. Metaphors don't change the meaning of something horrible into something nice. If the Qur'an uses graphic torture as a metaphor, then it means some sort of unimaginable suffering. It cannot mean something benign. So whether unbelievers are to be literally burned forever, or it is a metaphor for some other inconceivable torment, the result is exactly the same. A punishment that will cause unimaginable suffering and the most extreme pain possible, whether it be physical, mental, or spiritual. There now seems no end of verses that I could no longer ignore. Verses that allowed slavery or punishment such as flogging and amputating hands. Nonsensical stories of Solomon and his army of jinn and talking birds. Eunice swallowed by a whale. Squadrons of stone-throwing birds that obliterate armies. And a savage tribe of Gog and Magog imprisoned behind an iron wall. The creation of Adam and Eve, which is clearly at odds with the evidence that modern humans are a result of a long cumulative process of evolution. Or the mighty kingdom of Solomon, the like of which will never be seen again. Yet despite the abundance of historical and archaeological evidence for other empires at the time, there is not one scrap of evidence that Solomon even existed, let alone had a mighty kingdom. Or the adventures of Zulkarnain that sound suspiciously like the well-known fictional legends about Alexander the Great. The Qur'an was simply unravelling before my very eyes. It was as though I had been under a magic spell and suddenly I had woken up. I asked myself, what was it that was so miraculous about the Qur'an? The traditional claim is that the Qur'an is inimitable and of such linguistic excellence that no human could produce. Firstly, being inimitable doesn't mean it's from God. Most authors and artists leave their fingerprint on their work, making it impossible to imitate exactly. It doesn't mean it's from God. Secondly, linguistic excellence is subjective. I've read several books by Arabic scholars detailing the amazing style, rhetoric, linguistic techniques, etc. But the very process of deciding what to highlight and what criteria to use is inevitably subjective. Is repetition always a good thing? Is ambiguity a sign of divine eloquence? Are verses, the meaning of which Muslims have argued over for 1,400 years, proof of superhuman clarity? 
If I cannot see this miracle after 50 years of studying the Quran and classical Arabic, how can most Muslims, never mind non-Muslims? Less than 5% of the human race speaks Arabic, and only a small percentage of Arabic speakers know classical Arabic in any depth. A miracle that most humans can't verify for themselves is a poor miracle indeed. Was that really the best an all-wise God could do? A more modern defense of the Qur'an's divine nature is that it contains scientific miracles. But when I looked into each one, it was obvious that it was utter nonsense. I kept my doubts and views to myself, apart from some discussions with my two brothers. Then, out of the blue, I received a text from my eldest sister. It read, How are you doing? I heard, starting me, that you are becoming an apostate. Maybe you should try to get hold of American writer Jeffrey Lang's Help, I'm Losing My Religion. Love, Kiss Kiss. Seeing the word apostate made my heart skip a beat. I put the phone quickly back in my pocket and told myself that I shouldn't reply, as sharing my thoughts would only upset my sister. But the truth was, I still couldn't admit to myself that I was an apostate. My dwindling faith did, however, make it impossible to carry on at Islamia school, and I resigned in 2006. I got a job as an online teaching mentor. This gave me the flexibility to take care of my four children and my mother, who was now suffering from Alzheimer's. My two ex-wives were happy for the children to stay full-time with me. They knew I was a good father. I had always been the sort of person people could rely on. I was good at sorting things, fixing things, taking care of things. But unknown to them, I was gradually slipping into a deep, deep depression. There were several factors. I was juggling so many things, trying to stay in control. A single working father taking care of my children, the eldest of whom was now living in supported accommodation for those suffering mental health issues. On top of that, caring for my mother with Alzheimer's. My day would be getting up early to wash and dress my mother, make her breakfast and give her a medication. Get my two younger ones up, make breakfast, pack their lunches, take them to school, visit my eldest son, clean his room, cook him food, come home, cook for my mum, spend some time online checking and sending work to my students, pick up my children from school, cook dinner, deal with my mum's mood changes, which, which often meant the children had to be ushered away to their bedrooms, help them with homework, get mum changed and put into bed, then get up several times throughout the night to my mother calling me. Her Alzheimer's affected her sleep pattern and all sense of time. Of course, in addition to all of this, I had lost my faith. I had slipped into a nihilistic existential crisis where I could see no meaning nor joy in life. I felt powerless and the situation seemed hopeless. After three years of this routine, day in and day out, I went to the doctor for advice. She prescribed antidepressants but that had the immediate effect of making me feel suicidal. And a few weeks later, I attempted suicide. It was the lowest point of my life. But strangely, it lifted a weight from me. My sister stepped in to care for my mother, and my two ex-wives realized the stress I had been under and also stepped up to take some of the burdens. My brother insisted I stay with him for a while on his farm in Oxfordshire. Getting away from all the stress and spending time out in the countryside was amazingly therapeutic. I immersed myself in work on the farm, doing deliveries, helping with lambing, doing the barbecue on open days, collecting eggs, making wooden benches, and just about every other odd job. I was able to get my perspective back. I can't say I have solved my existential crisis, but it no longer seems to matter so much. As far as Islam is concerned, I know I don't believe in it anymore. It doesn't mean I have fundamentally changed. I'm the same person I've always been. But one cannot simply choose to believe or disbelieve. I just no longer believed the Quran was the word of God. I wasn't evil, arrogant, bad, or willfully turning away. I had struggled with it long and hard. I had attempted over many years to make sense of problematic passages, but I had to admit, in all honesty, the answers I found didn't satisfy me, intellectually, spiritually, or morally. If there is a God, he would surely want me to use the heart and mind he gave me, despite its limitations. He would surely appreciate my honesty and sincerity in calling it as I see it. I don't hate Islam. I know Islam, like other religions, brings a great deal of good and comfort to many people's lives. And I know, of course, that Muslims are good, decent, loving people. 
And whether I like it or not, Islam remains very much part of my life because of my Muslim family, friends, and of course, because it has been the major influence in my life for 60 years. Many of its good teachings are still ingrained in my character. But I simply don't believe it is from God. I believe all religions are man-made. As for God, I'm agnostic. I just don't know if there is some sort of a God or not. I don't think anyone really does, if they're really honest with themselves.